This is the story of Inter-Canadian Flight 1678. On the 13th of March 1994, an ATR-42 was to fly from Val d'Or Airport in Quebec to Dorval Airport, also in Quebec. At about 10 a.m., the ATR-42 took off from runway 18. As the plane climbed, the first officer was the one at the controls. They'd been asked to climb to 21,000 feet by ATC. The plane climbed as the Canadian countryside stretched out in front of them. This went on for some time. Suddenly, as the plane climbed through 17,000 feet, an explosion rocked the ATR-42. The plane wobbled from side to side. The air in the cabin was sucked out as it depressurized in a matter of seconds. The pilots immediately stopped climbing and started a descent. It looked like the right-hand engine had failed. And so as the plane descended down to a safer altitude, the pilot started work on the single engine failure checklist. The first officer contacted Montreal Area Control and told them about their situation. They cleared flight 1678 down to 11,000 feet. In the cockpit, the pilots were worried about a potential in-flight fire on the right-hand engine as they observed fuel leaking from the engine. The first officer pulled the fire handle and declared an emergency with ATC. Seven minutes had passed since an explosion rocked Flight 1678. They were still airborne and things were under control. The first officer decided to go into the cabin to see what had happened. The first officer could see a gash in the right-hand side of the plane below a window seat. To their shock, they noticed that the frame of the seat itself had been sliced through by something. Once back in the cockpit, the pilots had some tough decisions to make. Obviously, something had gone catastrophically wrong, and the fuselage itself sustained a lot of damage. But they couldn't judge the full extent of the damage from inside the cabin. The damage on the outside could be a lot bigger than the tiny gash that they could see. As they didn't know how badly their plane was damaged, they tried to turn as little as possible to avoid stressing the aircraft too much. If the crack grew any further, well, that could end very badly. Minimizing further damage was of paramount importance as they were still half an hour away from all of their diversion airports. For example, Mirabel was 39 minutes away, Val d'Or was 36 minutes away, and Dorval was 44 minutes away. They opted to continue on to Dorval. It's not explicitly stated in the report, but I think that they opted to continue on to Dorval because that's the flight path that required the fewest amount of turns. Think about it. To get back to Val d'Or, they'd need to do a 180, and they really didn't want to do that. At 10.28 a.m., the plane cautiously started a descent to 9,000 feet. It stayed there till it entered the Montreal Terminal Zone, and then after that, it continued its descent. On the way down, the pilots requested the airport to have emergency vehicles on standby, just in case something went wrong. Flight 1678 lined up with runway 06 left. I imagined that that was very stressful, with them hoping that their plane held it together for a few more minutes till they reached the runway. Thankfully, it did. At 11.16 a.m., Flight 1678 touched down safely and all on board were okay. Once on the ground, the pilots got a first-hand look at what had happened. The right-hand propeller was missing. One of the blades on the right-hand propeller had broken off and the blade went right through the fuselage. It was so close that it went through the cabin and cut through a seat that was unoccupied. Thank God for that. The seat isn't the only thing that was spared. They found two slightly bent hydraulic lines where the blade had gone through. Had the blade cut through those, it would have made controlling the ATR much more difficult or near impossible. Once they got a feel for what had happened, they started looking at the engine much more closely. They found traces of the stress that the engine and the airframe had been through. Six of the eight bolts securing the engine to the rear mounts had been sheared off, and three forward mounts were torn away as well. It wasn't like the engine would just fall off, but it's a testament to the stresses that the plane was under throughout the entire ordeal. To have any hope of figuring out the mystery of Flight 1678, they needed to find the missing propeller. When the engine failed, the plane was flying over the Kabanga Reservoir in Quebec. If you know anything about Canada, it's that it's massive. Finding this tiny propeller in the vast Canadian wilderness 
would be like looking for a needle in a haystack when you don't even know where the haystack is. Thankfully, a couple of mathematicians were already on the job. They were able to use ballistics to predict where the propeller would have landed, and their predictions were right. They were able to find the propeller, but not the shard that had broken off. Can we take a second to appreciate the mathematicians? For example, in the case of Air France Flight 66, link on your screen right now, something very similar happened. The engine failed and a disc was flung out of the engine into the snow-covered plains of Greenland. They were able to use math to find the disc with pinpoint accuracy. Absolutely incredible when you consider the fact that I can't even find my wallet half the time. With the propeller in their possession, they could begin to study it. These types of propellers had cumulatively accumulated more than 17 million hours of flight time, so if there was something wrong with them, they needed to know. The blade that had failed was manufactured from a particular type of aluminum alloy that was very resistant to stress corrosion cracking, but yet the surface of the fracture showed telltale signs of corrosion. In fact, most of the surface area showed signs of corrosion. When they looked more closely, they saw that there were tiny little pits in the metal. These pits were the focal point of the metal fatigue in the blade. The corrosion occurred inside the blade, which then formed cracks, and over time those cracks slowly moved towards the surface, till one day, the rigors of flight was just too much and it snapped. The fact that the crack started inside the blade meant that the crew had no idea that something like this would happen. This isn't something that you'd notice on your pre-flight walk around of the airplane. As the investigators studied the case of Inter-Canadian Flight 1678, they noticed that another very similar accident occurred on the 30th of March, 1994. In that case, a blade broke off because of fractures that originated from a small pit in the metal. These small pits in the metal are signs of a type of corrosion known as pitting corrosion, as it leaves behind small pits that then weaken the metal. It's basically the result of a chemical reaction that occurs when acids are in contact with metals. That poses a problem for us. The propeller is subjected to a lot of stress. It's subjected to a lot of water and even other fluids like oils and greases, but it's rarely exposed to acids, if at all. But for this type of corrosion to occur, it needs an acid. They got their answer from the manufacturing process of the blade. The blade has this interior cavity, and the blade needs to be balanced properly for it to perform optimally. The balancing is done by stuffing the interior of the blade with lead wool. The lead wool is then kept in place with a cork. Lab-grade cork, not just regular cork. The interesting thing is that when the corks were manufactured, they were cooked in steam and washed with chlorinated water. When they tested the cork, they found traces of chlorine in the cork. When the trace amount of chlorine and the water mixed, they produced an acidic residue which started to attack the metal of the blade, creating pits that the investigators saw. That meant that the chlorine had been there since the cork was manufactured, and this accident was just waiting to happen. That's truly an insane series of events. Who would have thought that something as small as a cork with a tiny bit of chlorine on it could make flying so dangerous? But as with all accidents, the really important thing is what we do afterwards. In this case, the safety improvements were two-pronged. One was to account for the propellers that were already in service, making sure that they didn't have this very same problem. So the investigators required ultrasonic inspections to check for pit and corrosion. They also required that mechanics inspect the corks themselves every 1,250 cycles or so. In newer blades, they decided against the corks as a whole to avoid this whole situation in the first place. No cork, no problem. In addition to that, they changed the manufacturing process to prevent water from getting into the taper bore after the lead wool was inserted. They hoped that these measures would keep future flyers safe. Here's the thing about metal fatigue, though. It's never going away. Not unless we make a drastic leap in material sciences. Engine parts, turboprop, or jet are put under so much stress that even the slightest imperfection can grow into a catastrophic failure. Take for example the Air France A380 incident that I referenced earlier. The turbine that failed was supposedly made out of an alloy that was impervious to a type of metal fatigue. 
but due to slight imperfections, it failed. There's no such thing as 100% reliability. But investigations like the one done after Inter-Canadian 1678 make failures like these much less likely. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.